Well, let's lift our hands to the Most High God and worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Ancient of the... Let him hear your voice. Open your mouth and worship him. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him all the adoration. Magnify his holy name. There's no one like him. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We give you all the glory. We give We give you all the glory. We give you all the Jesus. We give you We give you King of kings and Lord of lords, the ancient of days, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Glory be to your holy name. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Father, tonight, the way only you can do it, visit your children. Surprise every one of us. Save souls tonight. Heal tonight. Deliver tonight. Glorify your name tonight. And that day I'm committing especially into your hands all your partners, old and new. Please, in a very, very special way, promote them. Answer all their prayers. Amen. Let their joy overflow. Amen. As they are lifting up our hands in this assignment, Father, lift them up. Amen. Don't let them ever lack. Amen. Just let it be well with them. Amen. Daddy, I'm praying that tonight, before we all leave here, Let there be evidence that we have been with Jesus. Yeah. Revive this land. Yeah. Like you have done before. Let there be revival in this land. Yeah. Let your light shine and drive away darkness. 
so that at the end of it all, your name and your name alone will be glorified. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, before you sit down, before. <laughs> I went for a prayer walk this morning, and halfway through the walk, that disturbed me. Right? in the public there. And he says, son, when you get to the service this evening, the first thing I want you to tell my children is that I'm a sovereign God. I do as I like in the course of heaven and nobody can challenge me. So he asked me to tell you, tonight, I will rearrange your destiny. Then he went further to say, that there are some of you here that it has been said concerning your family that no great thing can come. He asked me to tell you he will disappoint them. Well, I was almost about to begin to dance on the street. He went on to say that among those of you who will come here tonight, he will raise up people who will be known as destroyer of poverty. By then, I was almost drunk with joy. But he went on to say, that someone will come here tonight with a prayer, saying, God, speak to me tonight. Well, whoever that fellow is, God asked me to tell you, you win. Now, if you believe that any of this saying belongs to you, I don't want to hear a UK hallelujah. I want a heavenly shout of hallelujah. shaking hands with one or two people and telling him or her, God is going to surprise you tonight. <laughs> and then you may please be seated. <laughs> A 
A day is coming. Mark my word. When you will come to festival of life, we will sing, we will dance, and they will call me forward, and you will be expecting a summer. And all that God will do, we just speak to you, and we will go home. Because as far as I'm concerned, if what I've just told you is what he wants to say, and we just pray now and go home, I think we will not have come in vain. Particularly, if you are the one he says, win-win. How many winners are here now already? Okay, praise the Lord. Well, during the, our last convention on the Holy Ghost night, Daddy wanted to speak, but I wanted to preach. <laughs> Thank God he didn't knock me on the head. Because you don't come here to hear me. You come to hear God. And when God speaks, it is done. I already rejoice with those of you who are here because he had spoken. But I have his permission to speak a little. I will shut up as soon as he says shut up. Tonight we want to talk about great expectations. Our text will be Psalm 9, verse 18. Psalm 9, verse 18. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. I have good news for somebody here tonight. No matter how difficult your situation may be now, your tomorrow is going to be all right. As long as you are still breathing, there is hope for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 4. The Bible tells us that uh, to him who is joined to all the living, the one who is still alive, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. It may call you a dog right now, but if you are still living, <laughs> One day, those who call you a dog will call you a liar. Yeah. Don't kill yourself. No matter the situation, don't ever consider suicide. Because in Job chapter 14, from verse 7 to 10, Job 14, 7 to 10. The Bible says, even if you cut down a tree, as long as you allow the root to remain in the ground, there's hope. Because one day it will rain. Once it rains, the tree will begin to grow again. He said, but when a man is dead, well, there's nothing more we can say. Don't kill yourself. Doesn't matter what hardship you are passing through. Stay alive. Because the real purpose of God bringing us together 
tonight is to tell somebody there is hope for you. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> The Almighty God says in Psalm 150, verse 6, Psalm 150, verse 6, let everyone who has breath praise God. <laughs> if you are still breathing, huh, you have cause to rejoice. Believe me honestly, as long as Jesus is on the throne and you are still breathing. But the next time I see you, you'll be shouting for joy. <laughs> you see, the promises of God are yea and amen. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 2 Corinthians 1, Verse 20, rather. Second Corinthians 1, verse 20. And according to Numbers 23, verse 19, Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie. A pastor may lie. An archbishop may lie. An apostle may lie. But God, it's impossible for him to lie. Why? Because he's the truth. And the truth can't lie. God has a timetable for everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from verse 1 to 8. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. He has a time for everything. But you know what? According to Psalm 112, Psalm 102, <laughs> verse 13, I'm excited. So if you, if I'm, <laughs> according to Psalm 102, verse 13, the Bible says, God is going to arise. He's going to have mercy on Zion. Why? Because the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. If you believe that I'm not saying this one to make you happy, but something tells you that at long last your time has come, Shout hallelujah. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, if you link it with our text, that the needy is not going to be forgotten forever. And you link that to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, that the Almighty God can raise the poor out of the dust. That he can lift up the beggar from the dunghill and cause him to begin to dine with princes. You will know there's hope for you. If you don't have an example that you could relate to, of God lifting up somebody from the dunghill and raising him up to a level where he begins to die with kings. You are looking at one example right in front of you. <laughs> I went to an African country not too long ago and we visited the president. The first thing he said is, I've heard about you. How your father was so poor, the poor called him poor. <laughs> I laughed. 
But the son of that man, who was so poor, poor people called him poor, is now the one talking to the president. I've told you the story before. Please pay attention to me. I won't be long. Because this is not an ordinary FOL. I mean, my daddy said he would rearrange your destiny. <laughs> I went to an African country, and they said the president will see me for 15 minutes. And he kept me for almost five hours. And when I told him, sir, your people are waiting at the stadium, he said, let them wait. He said, they have people they can talk to. I have no one, but I've heard of you. Now you are here with me, I don't know when you will come back again. And he kept on unburdening his heart. And I was giving him advice. When we finally left, and we were on our way to our car, I said to my wife, who am I? That the president would say, I don't want you to go. But there is a God who can pick up a beggar from the dumb hill and raise him up until he began to die with princes. I went to another country. They always say 15 minutes. And the president, as soon as we got in and we started talking, we just kept on and on. And he asked me if I would drink tea. Well, presidential tea. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, some of you who are seated here now will soon be dining with kings. Daddy, that's, that's thinking high. We are here for great expectations. <laughs> By the time I was leaving, and it was a day of his cabinet meeting. By the time I was coming out of the house, I was hearing one minister saying to the other, who is this man who is keeping the president for two hours? And somebody, somebody said, he's one pastor from Nigeria. And the other, other fellow said, he's not even a bishop. <laughs> Mark tonight. Because the tide is turning for you tonight. <laughs> See, when God says, I will rewrite your destiny, it means where there was no greatness before you will put greatness. <laughs> the promises of God are yea and amen. And when we talk about him picking up a beggar from the dunghill and raising him up till he begins to die with kings, that brings me to what we will use as a case study tonight. And that is in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. It's a story you know very well. Mark 10, 46 to 52. It's the story of a beggar called Bartimaeus. He was blind. He had been blind all the days of his life. Then one day, just like this, he woke up as a, as a normal day. Blind, automatically poor. Beggars are hard-working people because they just sit down there begging. Beggars don't go on break. 
but he still remained poor. The something told him, your day had come at last. And several things happened the moment Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by. Suddenly, he had a series of expectations, each one very great. Expectation number one. And we are using Batmeus as an example that if God can grant the request of a beggar by the roadside, he can grant your own too. Somehow, Batmeus expected that darkness will lose its hold on him. As a matter of fact, he expected that he would not spend another day in darkness because he knew somehow that the one who is passing by is the light of the world. John chapter 9, verse 5. He knew that according to John chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, John 1, 4 to 5, this is the light that no darkness can overcome. He also was aware that this light that was passing by and is now passing by in London tonight yeah. is the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts means he's the controller of all the hosts in heaven, of all the hosts on earth, and of all the hosts in the power of darkness. He was aware that at long last somebody is passing by who can give victory to anybody. That's why I rejoice with the fellow that God said, you win. Because many of us, whether we realize it or not, we are where we are today because of forces of darkness fighting against us. That's why I thank God for the play that we saw. That play is a message. It's a message to somebody. Number one, that we will receive mercy tonight. Number two, that God is going to give you victory. And number three, that forces of darkness will let you go. Yeah. Batmeos expected that darkness would let him go. You have a right to expect tonight that in every facet of your life, darkness will let you go. He had expectation number two, that God will hear him. And God is going to hear somebody tonight. <laughs> the one God will hear will say amen, of course. <laughs> because even as a beggar, he knew that ah, God made some promises. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, he said, if you call on me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. He knew the Bible a little. He knew it is written in Psalm 50, verse 14 to 15. Psalm 50, 14 to 15. If you thank God, and you call on him in the day of trouble, 
He says he will answer you. He knew that it is written, if you call on God when he's near, he's going to give you an answer. I believe that God is near tonight. Um, anyone who is not 100% dead can feel his presence here. He's near you. And you are going to call on him. Oh, later tonight, you're going to pray. And believe me, as a true child of God talking to you, tonight, my God is going to answer prayers. Yeah. And his approach was right. When the Lord was teaching the disciples how to pray, he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Matthew 6, from verse 9 on, the moment you say, Our Father which art in heaven, what is the next thing you should say? Hallowed be thy name. This man approached God the right way. Jesus, thou son of David. He started by eulogizing him. Thou son of the giant killer. Thou son of the great king of Israel. As it is, before he asked for mercy at all, he spoke in a way that will attract the attention of God. The problem with many of us is that when it is time to approach God, at the moment we call on him, we begin to tell him what we want him to do. Whereas you need to praise him to attract his attention. Because he said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Because the Father loves such to worship him. And at one time or the other, since this program began tonight, I'm sure you felt the Holy Spirit coming down through the worshipers. All those who ministered in worship tonight, they have been extraordinary. God just, I mean, when you listen to them, something will tell you, well, we know these people are good, but tonight they seem to excel. Because the Almighty God Himself wants to draw near. You will notice that there, there is no major, big preacher to come and preach and go through the Bible and give you theological training. But there will be a lot of worship here tonight. But uh, just in case you didn't get it then, Maybe I give you another opportunity to shout hallelujah. <laughs> One, he expected that darkness would leave him alone. Two, he expected that God would hear him. You have a right to expect that God will hear you tonight. But then his expectations were not small ones because he expected that day that the heavens and the earth would stop for him. Somehow he knew that the one who is passing by is the one who controls the movements of heaven and earth. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 28, Acts 17, verse 28, tells us, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. The Lord asked me to tell somebody, 
He said, your winter season is over. And by the time the sun rises tomorrow, your summer begins. Yeah. Acts 17 verse 28 says, In him, that is in Jesus Christ, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. What's that saying? Everything revolves around him. When Jesus stood still, the heavens stood still. The earth stood still. If he doesn't move, the earth will stop rotating. This man expected that the heavens will stop for him. How could he expect that? Well, he knew that heaven had stopped for Joshua before. You know Joshua chapter 10, from verse 12 to 14? Joshua 10, 12 to 14, when Joshua told the son, son, stand there, don't sit. Moon, stay where you are. Until my case has been settled. Do you know there is someone here today? I don't know who in particular. The heaven is going to stop for you tonight. <laughs> Believe me honestly, I don't know who. There might be two of us because I know I'm one of them. Whatever God is doing in heaven, He's going to stop it until He has solved your problem. <laughs> heaven has stopped before for Joshua. But even more than that, heaven has moved backwards before for Hezekiah. You know the story. I sat at the eight from verse 1 to 8. I sat 38 from verse 1 to 8. The sun moved backwards in order for God to deal with a particular situation. We had a testimony, I think about two Holy Ghost services before in Nigeria. When a woman went to the doctor for one operation, one procedure or the other, and they asked her, how old are you? And she said, 58, and they said, sorry, you are too old. We can only do this thing for people who are below 55. And then she came to the Holy Ghost service, and as she was entering the Holy Ghost service, God spoke and said, there's someone here, uh, I've reduced your age by five years. She said, ah, looked at the husband and said, you, you hear that? We are going back to the doctor. They went back to the doctor and said, hello, doctor. Doctor said, yeah, I told you, you and she said, ah, wait now. <laughs> I'm only 53 years old now. <laughs> and the doctor, the doctor laughed. Ah, last week you were, you were 58. Now you are... Uh, don't argue, doctor. Go ahead and do what you said you wanted to do. And she showed us the evidence of the success of the procedure. Whoever it is that God has to reduce your age so that his purpose for your life may be fulfilled, that age will be reduced tonight. You know, when God wants to perform a special miracle for you, He can even bring the future to the present. If there's a miracle that is waiting for you ahead, but He decides to do something special just like He says He will do tonight, 
it can bring the future to the present. A very good example is the play that they showed you. The story there is in Matthew 15 from verse 21 to 28. Matthew 15 from verse 21 to 28. When the woman said, I, I, I want a miracle for my daughter. And Jesus Christ said, no, we can't give the children of uh, sons to dogs. That's it's not the time for Gentiles yet. Because the time for Gentiles came years later in Acts chapter 10. But for this particular woman, God brought the future to the present. Before somebody leaves here tonight, that breakthrough that should happen to you in 10 years' time will happen tonight. God is able to do that because Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, Revelation 1 verse 8, Jesus Christ said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come, the Almighty. The past, the present, and the future, they all meet in him. You know, when they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, one hand was pointing to the right, the other was pointing to the left. The one pointing to the left is covering everything from eternity to the present. The one pointing to the future is pointing to that which is long, long yet to come. And they all meet together in him. With the left hand, it takes care of all your past. Whatever had happened in the past, the cause that was pronounced on your parents, etc., etc., every evil in your life from the day you were born till now, that one is taken care of. Now, for somebody, it's now reaching to the future. Every accident waiting for you in the future is cancelled. Every tragedy waiting for you in the future is cancelled. Every problem waiting for you in the future is cancelled. It can bring the future to the present. So he knew that somehow the heaven will stop for him. He knew that. And then number four, he knew that God will send for him. It's one of his expectations. He knew that God will send for him, not because he deserves it, but because he knew God was rich in mercy. That's why when he was crying, all he asked for was mercy. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4 tells us that God is rich in mercy. He had heard. He didn't attend any crusade. But the news of Jesus Christ spread all over the place. He had heard that this one who is passing by had broken protocols before to attend to a leper. Mark chapter 1, from verse 40 to 45. Mark 1, 40 to 45. A leper came to him and said, I know you can make me clean if you are willing. The Bible said, Jesus Christ said, I will, and touched him. The book of the law, the Bible says, you should not touch a leper. If you touch a leper, you become unclean. But the Bible says Jesus moved with compassion. That when mercy comes to play, even the rules 
can be bent. I don't know how God is going to do your case, but if he has to suspend all the laws to get to you, he will do so tonight. I'm sure you remember when he told the disciples, okay, go into the boat, go to the other side, I come and meet you. And he went to the mountain to pray and he enjoyed the presence of his father so much that by the time he realized all the boats had left, he broke the law of gravity and walked on water to go and reach the disciples. I have several stories I could tell you. It's just that tonight is not a night for stories. Because what God wants to do is urgent. He walked on water. He told gravity to shut his mouth so he could reach his disciples. I don't know what loss God is going to suspend tonight. But because of someone here in particular, Every law that must be broken will be broken. Yeah. So that your expectation will be fulfilled. Yeah. He knew that God would send for him because he knew mercy will propel him. And he realized from the stories he had heard in the, in the Bible that it doesn't matter where you are. When God has decided to be merciful unto you, he will send for you. You remember the story of David? 1 Samuel chapter 16. Thank you, Father. Daddy asked me to tell someone who is in a very tight corner. He asked me to tell you long before the end of this month I would have made a way for you. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Then they asked me to tell someone he said, my wind is blowing and every door that has been shut against you shall be blown open. Yeah. You know in 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 1 to 13, 1 Samuel 16, from verse 1 to 13, when God decided that it is time to pick a king, and he sent his servant to the house of Jesse. David was not brought near. He wasn't presented by his father. But God sent for him. And within hours, a shepherd boy became a king. Hmm. I believe that is a message for somebody straight away. Because your time has come. Yeah. In a way you can't understand. Yeah. You will reach the top. Yeah. This man expected that God would send for him. And you know, he did. Now, somehow, he knew. He expected that if he can only get the attention of the one who is passing by, he will never beg again. You know, before he got to Jesus Christ, the first thing he got rid of was that garment of shame. <laughs> the garment of a, level, of a beggar it's not going to be the most uh, expensive dress in town. But he knew he won't wear that dress again. 
I want to prophesy. This is me prophesying now. <laughs> and uh, my daddy is with me tonight. I want to prophesy to somebody, you won't borrow again. <laughs> he knew that the one he, he was trying to contact is the one who in Genesis 17 verse 1, Genesis 17 verse 1, the one who is called Jehovah El Shaddai. The God who is more than enough. And can I get in contact with the one who is more than enough and still lack? It's not possible. In 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1 to 7, 2 Kings 4, from verse 1 to 7, there was a widow who was destitute. He was able to make contact with Jehovah El Shaddai. And from that day onward, not only did she pay all the debt, she never borrowed again. Now, I know that you, you live in a country where things are run by credit. But I had the testimony of a young man here tonight who said within two years of getting here, he was able to buy a house. His father wasn't an angel. The mother didn't have two heads. If God can do it for him, he can do it for everybody. <laughs> do you know that there are people listening to me in here who before the end of the year will be completely debt free? This is a big one. Mm. Thank you, Daddy. Daddy says there's a miracle. So big, you are afraid to ask for it. But he asked me to tell you, ask and you shall receive. I received that. <laughs> because one of the miracles I want that might be even uh, a bit daunting to my faith is that within the next five years, what God is doing in Nigeria, He will be doing all over Europe. <laughs> That's a big one for me. Oh. But since he says ask, I'm asking now. And you will hear my testimony. Amen. You better say amen loud and clear. Amen. His poverty ended. He expected that it would end. And it ended. Number six. He expected that he will never be lonely again. Because Psalm 121 verse 5, Psalm 121 verse 5. Ah, thank you, my God. The Lord said, there's someone here. He said, your celebration that was canceled will be rescheduled. In Psalm 121, verse 5, the Bible said the Lord will be as close to you as your shade, as your shadow. You can't make contact with the one who promised in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5, that I will never leave you nor ever forsake you and be lonely. Spiritually, that is true. But I believe God is speaking to one particular person 
before the rest of your friends will know what is happening, you will be married. Yeah. But the expectation of uh, bad males was not just that he would no longer be lonely. Somehow, something told him that even his enemies will become his servants. You know, when he was crying to Jesus Christ for mercy, all the people around told him to shut up. But you know that within minutes, the same people who told him to shut up came to him with the greatest message of hope. Those who told him to shut up, they came to him and began to prophesy to him, be of good cheer. He calls for you. What does that mean? Be of good cheer, your problems are over. <laughs> Coming from the mouth of those who a few minutes ago told him to shut up, it shows you how great our God can be. The word of God made it clear. In, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it said, when a man's ways please God, he will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. I decree to somebody here today, all the enemies in your place of work, they will become your friends. All the enemies of your marriage, all the enemies of your progress, all the enemies of your joy, they will either become friends or become servants. Number seven. He expected that there be no more fruitless efforts in his life. That all these years he had been begging, 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 working very hard, and nothing to show for it. And fruitless efforts, like I've told you before, is another word for barrenness. Somehow he knew all his fruitless efforts are gone and gone forever. There's somebody here today, every form of barrenness in your life, whether physical or mental or material or ministerial, all barrenness are gone. Yeah. Hmm. Because somehow he knew, no matter how old you are, no matter how hopeless the situation may be, if you can just have a link with the all the living God, there is hope for you. Somehow he knew, ah, well, Abraham was very old. Sarah was so old that they said the womb was dead, but they were still alive when God paid them a visit and the impossible became possible. Tonight, in the name that's above every other name, the tide will turn in your favor. Daddy asked me to tell somebody. He says, relax. You will soon gain the upper hand. Yeah. All you need, brethren, is a single breakthrough. 
Bartimaeus got that single breakthrough. And all his expectations were met. I will tell you this story. When I became general overseer in 1981, <clears throat> there was quite a struggle before I surrendered to God. Because uh, <laughs> I was born poor. Getting education was uh, a struggle. One way or the other, I got a PhD. I became a lecturer in the university. The salary of the lecturer may not be much, but a lecturer at least will have food and have a car and have at least a flat to live in. I have reached that level. I had even become acting head of the department. And then God told me that uh, he wanted me to forsake everything and become pastor. <laughs> In a church that, is, uh, that was poorer than my father. <laughs> it was a big struggle. But then finally he won, as usual. <laughs> you can't wrestle with him and win. He won, and I became general overseer. And that's why I said, okay, now I'm general overseer. I want the church to grow. I think there should be something to show for letting go my position in the university. And I did everything I could. I fasted. I prayed, I studied the Bible, and every month I had a seminar. People would gather over a weekend, I would teach them the Word of God, and by Sunday they would disappear. There was nothing to show in the church for all the efforts. And then one day came, and I believe your day is coming today. Yeah. I was here in London. That's why, whether the devil likes it or not, London shall be saved. Yeah. In a room uh, loaned me by one of my members, to prepare the Sunday school pamphlet for the school, for, for the church. And it was close to my birthday when all of a sudden God spoke. Son, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, well, I, God, I don't know you are interested in birthdays. But if you are the one talking, could you please ask the question again? I have good news for somebody now. By your next birthday, God will pay you a special visit. <laughs> what do you want for your birthday, son? Ah, okay. If it's you, what I want is that every member of my congregation will receive a miracle. <laughs> That's how the Holy Ghost service was born. That's what we call Festival of Life here. From the day the Holy Ghost service started, the church started expanding. All you need is one breakthrough. Somebody's about to get that one breakthrough tonight. 
I'm not sure you heard me. A miracle that will turn all the tide. A miracle that can turn a congregation of less than 1,000 to millions. Somebody is going to get that breakthrough tonight. If you are the one, you won't be sitting down. Uh, uh, uh. If you understand, if you, un- if you understand that simple statement. Oh, let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> God bless you, be seated. Ah, thank you, Daddy. All right. That's what you can expect. That darkness will leave you alone. That the heavens will stop for you. That God will hear you. That he will send for you. That uh, you won't be lonely again. Your poverty will come to an end. And you will never remember it. Then there are certain things that God expects from you. Mm. Thank you, Father. The Lord asked me to tell someone. I told you you win. And that means very soon you will sing the song of victory. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you so, so much. I want to say amen to this. Mm. God said there's someone here tonight. He said, for a long time to come, one shout of joy will follow another in your home. (laughs) Well, if you are the one, why don't you start with a a shout of hallelujah? There are certain things God expects from you. Number one, he expects faith from you. But males had faith. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Mark 9, 23, the Bible says, all things are possible to him who believes. If only you can believe. If only you can believe that everything we've said thus far, this evening, is the truth. That God will do what he says he will do. Then get ready for that continual shouts of hallelujah in your home. Because when you go through the scriptures, as I've shared with you before, almost everyone who got a miracle from God got it by faith. Because Jesus will ask, do you believe I can do it? If you say yes, then he will say, be it unto you according to your faith. Number two, he expects your prayer to be intense. Bartimaeus prayed. He cried. 
He didn't pray the kind of prayer I've seen many of you praying here. Some people have asked me again and again, how come there are so many miracles happening in Africa more than uh, in the civilized circuit? The people here are too cold. You're too civilized. When it's time to pray now, which is going to be in the next few minutes, you will be amazed. You will pray so gentlemanly, so ladylike. We will begin to wonder, are we really in the presence of the Most High? Oh, but God is not deaf. Eh, who told you he's nervous? <laughs> it, when he said, he said, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God. In Nigeria, when it is time to pray, when I say the altar is open, people who want to pray can come. The ground shakes with their prayers. Because they know that if God does not help them, who is going to? Who is going to? That's why most of the time when I want to pray, when I really want to pray, I go out at night. So I can roar. And if I ever see anybody who says, ah, you are making too much noise, I say, ah, you should be on your bed. <laughs> Leave me and my God alone. When I want to really do some serious prayer, I don't stay where people are. You have an opportunity tonight. When they told Bartimaeus to shut up, did he agree? No. What did the Bible say? He got louder. In the, the, the drama that you have shown, when the, 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 the disciples told the Lord Jesus Christ, send this woman away, her noise is disturbing us. Did she go away? Did she keep quiet? We're going to pray tonight and God is going to hear you. But he expects from you intense prayer. Not only here tonight, for the rest of your life. If you live in a place where they, they, they don't like noise, and I know they don't much, why don't you go to the park? Go where you can roar. You can see, because when, eh, when trouble comes, those who can't shout now will shout. Trouble will never come your way. And like I told some of my children not too long ago, all these people who are pretending that they can't open their mouth. I watch them on television when Manchester is playing Sheffield. <laughs> and one fellow scores a goal. I see all those people shouting, jumping up, waving, whatever. And these people are supposed to be the quiet ones. When they get to the stadium, they shout. How can then you be in the presence of the one who is constantly scoring goals? <laughs> Number three, he expects you to testify. You know, I feel a bit embarrassed when they say it is testimony time here. 
Because I know that seated in this crowd tonight are at least a thousand people with outstanding testimonies. But they won't come forward. They want to sit down and hear the testimonies of others. What about your own? And let me tell you this one. A miracle that you have not testified about can be stolen. The devil can steal it. Because you will say you don't appreciate what God has done, so what's the use of you keeping it? But when you have testified, if the devil tries to steal your miracle, you say, <laughs> you're wasting your time. I've testified. The heavens have heard me say so. He expects you to testify. David said in Psalm 89 verse 1, Psalm 89 verse 1, uh, it's one of the beautiful songs we sing. Uh, we sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth. Will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness with my mouth? Will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. He expects you to testify. When he healed that leper in Mark chapter 1, from verse 1, from verse 40 to 45, Mark 1, 40 to 45, out of compassion, broke protocol, healed the leper. He even told the leper, don't tell anyone. The leper said, how can I keep quiet? After all these great things you've done for me, how can I keep quiet? Number four, he expects you to stick to him. Bartimaeus followed Jesus in the way. From that day on, he said, wherever you go, I go with you. And that's one of the reasons why he never lost his miracle. Because he stayed with the miracle worker. God expects you to stick with him. John 15, verse 4. John 15, verse 4, he said, Abide in me, and my word will abide in you. A brand can't bear fruit except it abides in the vine. That's what he said. You want to continue to enjoy all the blessings of tonight, abide with him. And then, of course, finally, he expects you to stay away from sin. Because I think it is uh, mommy who quoted that passage when she was praying. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28. Proverbs 10, verse 28 says, The expectation of the wicked shall perish. But the hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Continue to live a life of holiness, a life of purity, your tomorrow will be all right. I beg you, don't listen to those people who say once you are born again, you can continue to live in sin. That's not true. My God is a holy God. 
You cannot continue in sin and expect grace to abound. God forbid. You want to keep on enjoying the benefits of grace. You must stay away from sin because God is holy. May I conclude? God is passing by tonight. According to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Revelation 3, verse 20, he says, He's already at the door knocking. Open the door to him, and he will come in, and all your expectations will be fulfilled. So those of you who have, who have not yet opened the door to him, do so tonight. The greatest favor you can do yourself is to say bye-bye to a life of sin and surrender to the Almighty God, the Holy One. You know what? He made a promise. He said, when you come unto him, it doesn't matter how dirty your past has been. He said, I will know why it's cast you out. He made a promise. It's written in his word. So when you come to him, there is enough power in his blood to wash away all your sins. So if there's anyone here tonight and you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, or you claim to have surrendered your life to Jesus but you are still living in sin, I appeal to you, come very quickly. Come and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. I will count from one to ten. Before I say ten, make sure you are already standing here. Then we'll pray with you, and the Lord will save your soul, and all these wonderful expectations can be yours also. So if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, begin to come very quickly. God bless you. Yes, I can see you already coming. I know God is speaking to you. I know this is your night. Come very quickly. I'm counting now. Two. Thank you, those of you who are clapping. Your hand will never wither. Hurry up, those of you who are on the way. Come quickly. Come quickly. Three. Don't wait for anyone. This is just your night, your own special night of salvation. Come for a new beginning, a brand new beginning. The Bible says if a man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passing away, behold, all things have become new. So come very quickly. Four. Come to him. He's waiting for you. Keep clapping, they are coming. Keep clapping. Clap like warriors. <laughs> Five. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I know some of you are far away, but you have to hurry up. Six. Come. It is when you receive Jesus into your life, it is then you can say, Oh, Christ is in me. I have the hope of glory. Come very quickly. Come very quickly. Seven. The Lord is waiting for you. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. If you are still coming, you just wave your hand so I can see. Hurry up, hurry up. Eight. The Lord is calling you. He's calling you. 
He wants to save your soul. This is the opportunity you have. Nine. Thank you very much, God. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. That's the final countdown. Yes, hurry up. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. I see you coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. That's the final countdown. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yes, glory be to God. Thank you, Father. So those of you on the way, keep coming, keep coming. But those of us who are already in front, go ahead, begin to talk to the Almighty God. Ask Him to have mercy on you. Ask Him to save your soul. Ask Him to become your Lord and Savior. Promise Him that you will serve Him from now on. Keep coming, keep coming, those of you on the way. And the rest of us, let's stretch our hands towards those who are already in front and intercede for them. Pray that the one who saved your soul who saved their own souls also. Pray for them. Intercede for them. Keep coming, keep coming. I see you coming. I will wait for some seconds before I pray. But you have to hurry up now. You have to hurry up. You have to hurry up. God bless you. Keep coming. God bless you. Keep coming. And if you are a backslider, you knew Jesus before, but you have gone back into a life of sin, and you want to be restored to him, you can come forward quickly too. I will be willing to pray the prayer of restoration for you too. So if you, if you want to reconnect with Jesus Christ, you can come very quickly too. I will wait for one minute for you before I pray. Brethren, let's intercede for these people. Pray that God will give them genuine salvation. Yes, keep coming, keep coming. Those of you who want to be restored to Jesus Christ, come quickly. Those of us who are in front, talk to the Almighty God. Have mercy on me, Lord. I want to be your child. Forgive me. Forgive me, Almighty God. Wash away my sins. If you want to come, hurry up now because I'm about to pray. Particularly those of you who are coming for restoration. Come very quickly. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Now, if we are coming, keep coming. Don't wait. Just get here before I finish praying. My Father, my God, I want to bless your name. I want to thank you very, very much for your word. I want to thank you especially for those who have come forward tonight to surrender their life to you. Please, Lord, receive them in Jesus' name. Forgive them in Jesus' name. Let your blood wash away their sins in Jesus' name. Please, as we are saving their souls tonight, write their names in the book of life. Let them become true children of the living God. The sliders among them, take them back, O oh Lord. And from now on, whenever they cry unto you, answer them by fire. Do it, O oh Lord and we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ah, I rejoice with those of you who have come forward. Mm. Uh, from now on, by the grace of God, I will be praying for you. And very soon, you will be receiving miracles you have not even asked for then you will know there's somebody somewhere praying for you, and that somebody is me. So I'm going to need your names, your address, and your prayer requests. And when you are writing your address, 
Remember, now you're a child of God, you will write the true address. <laughs> Not only will you write the true address because you are now a child of God, but when I ask God to send your miracle, it will be sent to the address that you put down. So if the address is wrong, the miracle will go to the wrong address. <laughs> so your name, your address, and your prayer request. I'm going to need that. I think they were putting something on the, on the screen that you should, you should do something. <laughs> hey, everything is new now. <laughs> they say you have to scan. What do you call that? Thing? God have mercy. <laughs> Whatever QR means, just scan that one. Uh, alternatively, if you turn to your left, you will see some people holding up placards. Follow them. They will take you to where they will collect the information I need, and then they will bring you back very quickly. God bless you. You can begin to go. Now, if you want to clap for my Jesus, you do it very well. You do it very well. Thank you very much. Now, it is time to pray. And like I, warned, I warned you earlier, you're going to pray intensely. You may want to write down your prayer points so that you can follow them one by one. Number one, you want to thank the Almighty God that at long last, your own day of mercy has come. I want to thank him for bringing you here tonight that your own set time for favor has come. Number two, your prayers tonight is not a prayer of begging. It's a prayer of demand. We're going to demand by faith. And the first demand is, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I demand that darkness will leave me alone from now on. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I demand that forces of darkness will leave me alone from now on. And then your next prayer point will be, Father, hear me tonight. I demand that you hear me tonight. And then your next prayer point is, Father, if you have to stop the heavens and the earth to attend to me tonight, so be it. If you have to stop the heavens and stop the earth to attend to me tonight, so be it. And then your next prayer point will be Father, we are many here tonight. Please locate me locate me. I 
among this crowd, locate me. And then your next prayer point is that, Father, I demand that poverty will leave me alone. Poverty will become a stranger to me. Photographer, you should be writing down your own prayer point now. If you have any sense at all. And then your next prayer point is, Father, don't let me be alone anymore. Don't let me ever be lonely again for the rest of my life. And then the next prayer point is that, Father, I demand for the rest of my life no more fruitless efforts. And after that, any other major point you want, any prayer point you want, you go ahead and ask God. As we do it in Nigeria, the altar is open. If you want to draw near the altar for your prayer, you're welcome. You can kneel down. You can stand. Whichever posture you want and cry to the Almighty God. I will give you at least 15 minutes, but make the 15 minutes very intense. When I say cry to God, I may cry to God, not whisper. Go ahead, begin to pray.
Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I want to pray for you now. It will be in your own interest if your amen is loud and clear. The Lord will grant your request. Darkness will leave you alone. All forces of darkness operating in your home, I decree that they be bound. I decree that they lose their hold on your family. I decree tonight that God will hear you. He will answer your prayers. He will locate you. He will remember you. Amen. Whatever loss he has to cancel so that you can receive all your expectations, he will cancel tonight. Poverty will become a stranger to you. You will never beg again. You will never borrow again. That person that God says will become a poverty destroyer. That will be you. Yeah. Among those who will sing songs of victory, your own song will be the loudest. Yeah. You will never be lonely again. You will never fail again. Every ground you have lost as a result of fruitless efforts, you will regain them. Your story will become a big testimony. And the grace to stick to Jesus, God will give unto you. Your tomorrow will be all right. So shall it be. Amen. And you will serve God. Amen. Oh, like never before, you will serve God. Amen. You will testify. Amen. The world will hear your testimony. Amen. Through your testimony, several souls will be saved.
God will use you to perform miracles. Amen. It shall be well with you. Amen. It shall be well with you. Amen. It shall be well with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. If you receive that shout, a big hallelujah.